about a lot of things, though I'm not intimately detailed and detailedly <laughs> informed about the government shutdown, but I do have some insight into it, and I'm going to present my view of how it evolved uh, and who, who I think is bears the brunt of the responsibility for it. Uh, and uh, and what some of the impacts were, and uh, you know, discuss my opinion the nonsense of, of the shutdown. So uh, we have uh, Dwayne Bell and I, Dwayne and I are just here for the first time on Monday.com. So we don't know have not and have not heard each other's opinions on anything. So <laughs> Dwayne, I'll let you take it away with an introduction of yourself. Uh, okay. Um, my name is Dwayne. Uh, I am 53. Uh, I'm involved politically as well here locally and even on nationals issues. Um, I have worked for former candidates, uh, both here locally in our district here in Arizona, which is legis legislative district 06. Um, I have also worked on some presidential campaigns. Uh, typically, uh, the two biggest ones that I worked on was an active fundraiser for Ron Paul. And uh, in the last election in 2008, uh, I was also a fundraiser uh, and worked on the campaigns of uh, John McCain and Sarah Palin. Uh, I am a libertarian, log cabin Republican, uh, socially moderate. I believe inclusion wins. Um, and frankly, to tell you the truth, I'm really upset with the way that both parties are going. Years ago, I used to be a Democrat. I didn't leave them. They left me. And they have been speeding away from me rapidly ever since. But now there are many times I feel like the Republican Party is doing the same thing. Frankly, I would just like to at one time go into Congress in Washington, D.C., and grab a Democrat in one hand and a Republican in the other and say, we are getting tired of you, both of you. <laughs> <laughs> so, is, is that a bloody good way to start, or what? <laughs> yeah. you know, I used to be uh, uh, very active in the Democratic Party. I was actually the secretary of the local Democratic Party, and I ran as a candidate for office. Uh, this was my third time uh, on the Democratic uh, ticket. Um, but, you, you know, I, I'm really kind of loath to, we, we uh, many people, we self-identify or allow others to compartmentalize us into one of two boxes, Democrat or Republican. And, True. And the more and more I think people are beginning to identify themselves either as uh, independence or uh, some other uh, more conservative-leaning uh, ideology. Rarely do we hear people identify themselves as either of a, a, a differing leftist-leaning ideology, like fascist, socialist, or any of that stuff. But we do hear people talk about being libertarians, constitutionalists, uh, Patriots and that kind of thing, and, and that's where I, I really find myself lining up. I am not uh, Keith, could you do us a favor? Your microphone is fading in and out. Okay, that's because I'm sitting back. Uh, so, you know, I oh, think of okay, my, that's better. Thank yeah, you. I think of myself as a constitutionalist, um, and and a conservative, yes. and I make no bones about it. Um, uh, my, my beliefs stem obviously from from my upbringing and my experiences and, and observations uh, in life. I'm 56 years old, and I, you know, have a lot of life experiences, a very broad, varied life experiences across the country and in uh, different parts of the world. So I I am very conservative, but often people uh, mistake uh, my position or some things that I say as a of uh, or a promotion of a, a particular party or a de or, or that I'm deriding another party and that's not the truth. Really what happens with me is that I believe in facts and, and truth and stating things as they are and not reading a lot of other stuff and, and making making stuff up. You know, I got a, a little phrase that I use and I say, 
you're making shit up. Quit making shit up because it's 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 right here in front of you. So um, you know, with this government shutdown, uh, a lot of people are blaming the Republicans uh, and uh, you know the, the, the Tea Party uh, for this government shutdown. So let me say at the outset, I'm not defending. Uh, the Republicans, nor am I defending the Tea Party. But what I'm going to describe to you is is the process as I understand it. And if I'm wrong, then I would I would ask and I'd be delighted if someone could show me where I'm wrong. Right. So the process begins with the Constitution uh, defining uh, and stipulating that all spending bills must start in the House of Representatives. Regardless Absolutely. Of which, with, regardless of which party controls the House or has the majority in the House, all spending bills must start there. So the House of Representatives initiated and passed a spending bill that funded all operations of the entire United States government with the exception of one program. They did not fund in that bill the Affordable care act right and they, correct and they sent that bill to the u.s senate which is the other house of our congress of our, our legislative branch we have a bicameral legislative branch right two part two houses the senate didn't even call it for a vote they just rejected it and we don't like it we're not even going to talk about it because you didn't fund your bill doesn't include funding for that one program right so the Senate sent it back and says, you know, try again. Give us what we want. Well, the House says, you know, we're getting too uh, close to having to shut down the government here. We won't have money for it if we don't pass one of these bills. Tell you what, let's pass a bill that specifically funds uh, pay for the military and their spouses and families, uh, uh, veterans mm-hmm. benefits, and some other very specific spending um monies right or monies to be spent for some very specific programs and again the senate said no we're not even going to talk about it unless you include funding for the senate speaking to the house of representatives you, you guys have got to include funding for this one program and and if you don't then we're not even going to discuss anything right anything else even the the right. president of the united states went on national tv and said he would not negotiate. He wouldn't even negotiate. And there was a picture um, that went up. And I guess the the at, at some point, uh, several members of the House uh, uh, House of Representatives went to a negotiating table, and they were all sitting there on one side of the table. And there was absolutely no one from the U.S. Senate or the, or the administrative uh, branch at that table to negotiate. Right. So then. If if the if the Senate refuses to negotiate, refuses to even uh, acknowledge and engage in debate or bring forward vote a bill that has been presented to them that has been passed by the other house, how then can anyone say that it was the House who caused the shutdown or the Republicans? Because what they're saying essentially is Republicans control the House of Representatives and the Democrats control the Senate. So how can you say that the the Republicans shut down the government, right, when it was the Senate right. who refused to The Republicans passed a bill, more than one, and sent it over for the Senate who wouldn't even, even think about it. We didn't discuss it and openly stated they would not negotiate on it. So in my mind, that it is the Senate and or the president, the legislative the, the Senate, so by the Democrat, who caused the shutdown. And this Again, I want to point out, I'm not taking the position of me being an advocate for either party or me being uh, in, uh, in opposition to either party. I'm simply stating what happened and asking the question then, how do you, how do you go from, you know, we didn't do this and, and they did that and it's their fault. So let me draw you an analogy. Suppose I said to you, Dwayne, or Max, or whoever's listening out there, uh, Ken, suppose I said to you, um, I will, for the next year, 
I will pay all of your bills except for your cable bill. I'm not going to pay that one. you got to pay that yourself. Or, or go without cable, right? It's up to you, whatever you want. And you say to me, yeah, well, uh, if you're not going to pay all of my bills, including cable, then you're, I'm not going to let you pay any of them. And, and I'll just not pay my bills. And then when I go into default and bankruptcy, you will fall. That doesn't even begin to make sense. I'm telling you, I'll pay everything but one. You're telling me you really go bankrupt, then accept, you know, that that that, that. that's kind of where I'm at with the thing. Um, I, and and uh, you know, I'll just kind of stop there and let uh, let you talk a little bit, Dwayne. Um, okay. Um, you know, I I don't even know exactly how we even bridge this gap with the current government and both houses of Congress right now that we have. Um, to be perfectly honest, Keith, I think what I see here is that we have, on the Democratic side, some of the most self-serving politicians that we have ever had in the history of the country, and I would start directly with Barack Obama on this one, and on the Republican side, we have some of the most stubborn Republicans that we have ever seen who seem to lack a lot of common sense. I, to be perfectly honest, I, I, I'm, I'm at a, uh, how do you say, how do you say, I'm, I'm at a loss. I, I, I really don't even know how to begin to bring these two together because they're both yelling and no one's listening. And I, like many Americans, find myself uh, um, just praying for 2016 to come early enough that beginning in 2014, uh, we could just boot them all out. And just start over. I want to hit the reset button. I don't want to hit it. I want to kick it. <laughs> uh, you know, and I, I don't... Um, Harry Reid is being incredibly stubborn. Um, to tell you the truth, I think the only two people that I've really liked that we currently have right now uh, in Congress period is that are making any sense that are not there to be self-serving is Senator Ted Cruz and Senator Rand Paul. And I think Senator Rand Paul is in the lead. I think that he really seriously is concerned about the health and stability and safety and sovereign uh, status of this nation. Um, uh, the others just seem to be totally out for themselves. And I think that this all started and headed this way because we currently have a president right now in the White House uh, who has taken no responsibility for anything. He's always there to make sure that he can say, oh, I'm so glad I had something to do with that when things work out right. Yet when anything ever goes wrong, it's been George Bush's fault all along. Um, you know, and, and I'm surprised at how many Democrats have jumped on with this. Uh, I'm surprised at how many Republicans have kept their mouth shut. I'm stunned at how many people out that, that I see out in the field in my own neighborhood that, that are calling and, and talking to Congress and sending letters and sending emails that feel like they're being ignored, they're banging on the door and there's nobody home. Um, I can't honestly say I've ever really actually thought that I would see in the country be in this position where we are so divided, no one is listening anymore. And I don't know where to go from here. Yeah, you know, and I, I think you're right. Max has asked the question, how do we think about, what do we think about the can? Being constantly kicked down the road, um, and, and you know, I, 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 I think we all agree that it's wrong, but I think there's a reason why it's evolved that way, and it kind of goes back to something that Wayne alluded to with this, it's this um, separation and bipartisanship in our con Congress, and uh, this this one team versus the other mentality. Uh, but the, the root of that even goes back further. Uh, it's, it's societal and, and it's educational. So we are now seeing the, 
the result of education policy uh, that began to uh, come into fruition in the 80s and 90s, where our, our elected leadership now, uh, they don't they don't know or even understand what our form of government is, and, and they they vote, they, they base their decision on emotion. They don't read, uh, they don't comprehend, and uh, you know, as educated as many of them are, they they just don't get it. That you know, as an example, we have a separation of powers and, and a system of checks and balances. Congress is doing. The, the Congress is doing... Well, this is why I think that we wind up with the can. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm doing exactly what uh, There's not supposed to be this go along, get along, do whatever the president wants. Exactly. Uh, and the, the president, if that were the case, why would, why would he even need the Congress? The president just say what he wants and then that's it. And that's how it's done in a number of countries. And those countries are called dictatorships. They operate under a dictatorial form of government. We are a republic, not a democracy, folks. We are not a democracy. We are a constitutional republic, meaning that... Amen. Our Thank you. Constitution is the highest uh, law of the land, and all, all laws, policies, regulations have to fall with under the, within the confines of that constitution. Max, you've heard me say this before. The Constitution of the United States is a contract amongst the several states. states right? Initially, it started as a contract among 13 states. And then, as other states joined the union, they agreed to adhere to and abide by the terms of that contract. One of the terms of that contract is that the House of Representatives will initiate all spending bills. But there are several other elements of that contract, and specifically, you know, the, the Constitution the contract is a limitation on federal powers, and it says that if if there, if if a power is not specifically granted to the federal government, then it is reserved to the states or the people, right? So, as an example of that, of, of a power that is not specifically granted to the United States, now, I don't want to go off the tangent because again, this is only an example. Uh, the Constitution does not specifically grant the power of uh, establishing a Department of Education to the federal government. It doesn't. So that is reserved to the state, right? Education. Uh, what specifically is granted to the federal government is the power to create a post office, ensure interstate commerce, that would be uh, commerce between the various states. Right, make sure that that goes forth, and to provide for the national defense, an army and a navy. Right. Other than that, federal government should really be kind of a trivia question. Where is the federal government? What do they do? You know, I think you're over in Iowa. I would, I, I would love to see more power return to the states <laughs> and to the local communities. And I have said myself, Keith, several times, I would love to see the federal government be relegated to a five or six thousand square foot office right next to Radio Shack in a second rate uh, a shopping mall. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 again, you know, federal, and, and it's right there in the Constitution. So this is what I this is what I mean when I say that over time we've allowed our federal government to evolve and grow to this giant leviathan and the and the people that we send to represent us in government, they don't even understand that they they are they are, they've either created or helped create or are part of something that should not be, and so. But so are the voters, right? The exactly. voters are responsible for this as well because exactly. everybody wants their check. Everybody wants What's their that? benefit. Everybody They're wants this and everybody wants that, and they keep throwing these people into Congress that are coming back and telling them, "Oh, don't worry. You actually send me to Capitol Hill. I'll make sure that you get what's yours." Yeah. Well, that that is the. The ignorant, apathetic voter is the tool that these folks use to work the system, to maintain control, and and establish themselves as this elitist uh, cadre that that essentially dictates what the rest of the country does. You know, and this is why that the. 
We've never solved a budget problem yet, and frankly, I think that this is why government just keeps kicking the can down the road. Exactly right, and we never will solve a budget problem. We will never have a balanced budget. We will never even, I, I would be surprised if we ever even get a budget. We're going to continue with these continuing resolutions. That is ridiculous. You know, there's not been one single budget passed under Barack Obama. Not one. No, there hasn't. And for all Barack Obama's talk about how all the debt that George Bush left us was unpatriotic, I find it curious that uh, uh, if George Bush was spending at 65 miles an hour, uh, then why are we so comfortable now spending at 170? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't understand this at all. George Bush's debt was unpatriotic, but it's okay as long as I'm the Democrat in power, adding another two-thirds more to it. Right, and so there's the hypocrisy, and you know, I don't want to, I don't want this to devolve into an attack on the Democratic Party or uh, anything like that. I mean, we were talking, you know, specific. Um, Correct. Topic here, but, you know, you're, you're right. Uh, this this uh, the divisiveness across our nation is is taking many forms. Politically, it's the Democrats versus the Republicans, uh, and then and then within the the Republican Party, there's the uh, mainstream or, or old school GOP Republicans versus the new Tea Party Republicans. Uh, you know, in, in in the Democratic Party, there's a, there's also a split. We don't hear about it as much. It's not as as vocal. But I mean, there are the progressive Democrats and the more traditional, uh, uh, more conservative uh, Democrats, so to speak. Uh, you know, I'm running as a as a Democrat here in the 60th district, and uh, my message to voters is is you know pretty conservative. And, and when I speak about the issues as they affect our taxpayers and uh, the resources that are and that are being abused and uh, the misprioritization of our spending, and I, I'll tell you, everyone that I speak to agrees with my message. We need to change the way we're spending our money. We need to look for um, alternative uh, revenue resources and we need to look at options and opportunities to reduce our spending. So when I talk about those things with the voters, regardless of party ideology, they embrace them because it's common sense. And what I find is that sure, um, many times uh, we talk to ourselves, whether we are conservatives or we are liberals or we are Democrats or we are Republicans, we tend to talk to ourselves, right? So um, Republicans, as a rule, never hear the progressive liberal uh, uh, agenda and, and, and what they're saying, because it really doesn't make any sense to me yeah, most times. And, it doesn't and, and, make any sense to me either, but, you know, there's a lot of, I think that one of the reasons that that there is so much divisiveness today and there and it is so cold between uh, the divide today is because we have the liberal progressive agenda uh, who largely has a media on their side <laughs> that is basically feeding the constituency whatever it is they want to hear, whether it happens to be factual or not, and we have a dumbed-down electorate who has been the victim of public schooling for the last 25 to 30 years that, that doesn't know anything um and, and, you know and and if you want to keep people under control the very first thing in thing that you need to do to them is keep them ignorant ignorant yeah so hey max asked the question what about foxes the foxes of the world aren't they the conservative media last time i checked they're pretty enormous as well i think it both works both ways no Dwayne. so what do you think about that Dwayne? What about Fox? About the Fox media? being the conservative media, um, they they are to a point, uh, you know. And I've always kind of like called myself that uh, I'm a registered conservative first uh, before I'm a registered Republican. Um, I also disagree with a lot on my conservative party, and I think that conservatism is splitting off into many different uh, fractions as well that I don't understand. Um, I'm socially moderate, for instance. Um, I buck my own party in total support of uh, uh, gay rights and marriage equality. Um, a lot of my conservative friends do not. 
At the same time, I think that there is a lot of good conservative ideals that I still like, that I still follow. I want to see free markets. I want to see budding entrepreneurship. I want to see a flourishing private sector. I think the best way to do that is to get the government off the backs of the people because right now it is so bloated that it is the biggest business in the country and it's running at a deficit. Um, but the Republican Party is not going to be making any headway with trying to get people involved into what true conservatism is, which to me is the most important thing we have is fiscal issues, not social issues. And if the Republican Party can cannot get beyond running people for Congress like Todd Aiken, who says that a woman's body will shut down if she's raped, or here's an even better one, Richard Mordock, who says that if a woman is raped and she happens to get pregnant because of it, she shouldn't worry because it's a gift from God. And wait, at the wait, same wait, time, wait, if... Wait, wait, wait. Here, here again, not being a defender, but just being accurate, I just want to sh share this with you, Dwayne. When the Republican Party, you, you can't say the Republican Party is running them for office. Anybody can run as a Republican or a Democrat. All they have to do is circulate and get the petitions and submit the petition packet or meet whatever requirements there are to, meet to run on that party's platform. So these two guys you mentioned is not to say that the Republican Party chose them and said, hey, you, come over here. I want you to run for office. They just sat there. No, but the they track. backed them. Not necessarily. That's okay. Go ahead. Anyway, I, I just point out. I, I just you know want to educate you. The process to run for office is not that you have Correct. to get some approval or be uh, picked and chosen by some party apparatus to run for office. Anybody can run for any office on any platform and for any party they choose. And quite often, oh, absolutely. As is, as is my case, I'm running as a Democrat. Democratic Party has absolutely nothing to do with me. And they are actively working against me, the Democratic Party. So I'm, I'm the outsider Democrat that they, they <laughs> so, so someone might say, someone could say, well, Turner, you, you're you a Democrat, and the Democrats are running Keith Turner for public office. They're not. Democrats are not running. So would you consider yourself, Keith, to be kind of more like a blue dog Democrat? Or... I'm just a guy from the neighborhood. I'm running for office to us. I want to represent our taxpayers. Most of my taxpayers are Democrats, and I'm going to run on that ticket. Good for you. Good for you. I hope you're successful. Yeah. You know, I, I think, frankly, I just want to see what a lot of other people want to see. It's not necessarily a Democratic issue or a Republican issue. I think there's a lot of people out there like me who want to see some sort of common sense. Yeah. You know, but I also think that Neil Burtz, uh, uh had it right when he went ahead and he closed um, and he retired from his show. I don't know if you ever listened to Neil Burtz, but I, I really like him a lot. There's quite a few conservative people I like a lot, even though I disagree with them. And sometimes I want to just, uh, oh, I don't know, just take my car into the media when they say something really stupid. Um, but um, I think Neil Burtz actually uh, said it best that the issue that is really dividing uh, the Republican Party right now in particular, and I see this because I'm a log cabin Republican and I'm trying to work it within the Republican Party, not necessarily because I think that it is the future of the country, but because I really would like to see them get back to their roots of fiscal conservatism and not necessarily social conservatism. And there are a lot of younger voters under 35, uh, typically 30 and under, who look at the Democrats and they see, well, okay, they're willing to take me in, but I'm not really sure if I can agree with most everything they're saying. And then they look at the Republican Party on issues such as, as uh, um, uh, uh, gay marriage being a litmus test for being conservative or not, and they're so vapidly against it, almost to the point of being rapid, that younger voters look at these people and say, oh, well, I don't know if I want to be part of them either. They're nuts. 
and they're automatically turned off to the message of conservatism, but they know that they're really not in line with the Democratic Party either, and they're sort of sitting in a stalemate, waiting it out because they don't know which way to turn, and they're just waiting for somebody to come up with some common sense and make a breath of fresh air. And I think that if anything, what is probably has been the most positive influence that I have seen in any particular party, uh, to tell you the truth, Keith, has been college Republicans. But then again, I live in Arizona, and this is a conservative red love state. Arizona. <laughs> huh? We love Arizona. <laughs> I don't know if you would like Arizona during August when it's 108 and it's raining. Yeah, that's what I'm loving it, baby. Loving it. <laughs> A hundred and eight, and it's raining. <laughs> Arizona, Arizona and Texas are, are really uh, two of my favorite states. Not not only because of the uh, generally uh, conservative uh, mindset of, of your elected folk, but uh, there's a beautiful states there. There's really nice people. That's the, that's the case where we go. All the states. I don't know. I, I love the Arizona desert and and the heat, man. I love that heat and just wow. You know what? What's amazing? You can that? find almost any climate here in Arizona from A to Z. No. You know, if you want to be down here in the desert heat, there's plenty of it. If you want to go up into the mountains and grab a boat and go fishing up amongst the trees where it's like about 85, there are plenty of places to do that. Some of the best skiing in the country is about four hours north of us here in Snowball in the San Francisco mountains north of Flagstaff. Wow. I didn't know that. You know, it's a, uh, you, can, you can drive almost to almost any climate in this state in one day. You know, I, it's amazing. I, several years ago, I, I visited Arizona. Once I rode a motorcycle from Las Vegas to Indianapolis, so I passed through Arizona. I thought that was just exceptional. And what I didn't realize until that time uh, is that the desert is just full of color. You know, I went up some, some mountain paths, uh, just kind of spurred them over. I wonder where that road goes. I went up this dirt road, ended up on a, on a uh, desert bluff overlooking the valley, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And for the first time in my life, I experienced absolute silence. In the middle of the day, there was not, I couldn't hear anything. There was no sound, none at all. And I'm looking out over there. Do you like to read? I do, yeah. Um, I would recommend a book that, uh, um, uh, before we get too far off topic here, but uh, uh, one of my favorite politicians that we had uh, in this country uh, was Barry Goldwater. I, I really respected the man. He was rough. He was tough. He was the cowboy type. Um, he was also one of those people that dealt uh, directly with the public straight. He gave them bad news. He gave them good news. You never had to ask him where he was coming from. But he also wrote several books about Arizona and what it really meant to him being here uh, when Arizona first became a state. And he took a lot of his memories and trips that he made throughout Arizona on horseback. And he compiled it into um, a book that was printed in 1968 that had nothing to do with politics. And it was called Exploring the Southwest and Its Deserts. And it was all about the places that you can get to on horseback if you bring a pack mule, uh, bring plenty of food, uh, uh, bring a couple of guns and some pistols and, and some ammo just in case you run into something that thinks that you would look good if you were dipped in ketchup. Um, and take off on horseback and go to places that you can't get to by car or by motor vehicle. And you can be out there sometimes by yourself in solitude for a week. Yeah. These are incredibly beautiful places in canyons where there's this milk blue liquid pools that are so full of mineral spirits it feels good to take a bath in it. Uh, it it's fascinating, Keith. If you if you like that kind of now, a lot of that may be gone or may even be accessible now by roadway because a lot has changed down here since 1968. But it's one of the first books that he wrote that had some colored photographs in it. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll he was actually a very good writer. I think you would enjoy it. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a point to uh, to look that up. So Anyway, let's kind of get back on topic. Max is putting some stuff Okay. On. Let's jump back. I want to jump back. <laughs> <laughs> back on topic. Dwayne Book Club feature is coming in six months from now. Okay, <laughs> Preto <Pratino> Mio. <laughs> right. I'm going to go back. All right, so I'm going to come in here. 
What about the Foxes of the world? Okay, so I'm going to say this, uh, Max, that I don't think Fox uh, promotes an agenda. I think they do recording, and they, and they really are fair and balanced. I see them all the time. They have uh, you know, uh, people proposing viewpoints over there and panel discussions. They do uh, studio audiences where they have large numbers or a large group of people of varying uh, backgrounds and opinions, uh, presenting their opinions. I don't think the Fox News is... Is um, I, I think they present um, you know a balanced approach. They they, they report the news, um, they report facts, and yes, they do have uh, some of their folks who have who will offer opinion, but they are uh, they they make clear that it's their opinion, uh, and I, I don't see them as just promoting an agenda. I've also seen them. When I don't either. Yeah, I've seen them actually go after. Uh, the Republicans or the conservatives or whomever, somebody who's on the right, I've seen them take that position. I rarely, if ever, now you're kind of seeing it sometimes maybe happen with some of the leftists where they're, they're now speaking out about the uh, disaster of Obamacare implementation. Uh, and really, that's about it. Okay, what else you got there, Max? She says, uh, polling shows disapproval in Congress. Do you suspect the grand bargains are making blah, 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 blah. So the whole thing with the polling is that, um, you know, polls can be made to say whatever you want to say. But, you know, when Congress's appro approval rating gets down to zero, it's not going to make any difference anyway. Because the elections are a popularity contest. You have so many people who, who you know, are locked into voting one party or another. You know, as Dwayne said, we said at the beginning of this conversation, Dwayne talked about Democrats versus Republicans, right? So you're going to have people who are going to Right. Argue, you know, people like Harry Reid is going to be safe. That dude's been in office like 30 years or something. So, I mean, is Harry Reid? Yeah. No, I think Harry Reid was just recently elected uh, uh, and came into a position of power in, in, in 2008. I think he, he, he became speaker uh, or is president of the Senate or whatever, but he's been there a long time. Regardless. Oh, point, okay. I, I misunderstood you. You're probably right about that. My point is that as long as we have career politicians who can go to Washington or go to a state legislature and, or even a local uh, mayor or, or councilman or anything at any level where we have politicians who can sit in office for decades, you know, decades, 10. That I see as a big problem. I, you know, I was never in favor of term limits, but I'm beginning to think it's a really good idea because I don't know how we get some people off their federal seat. I, I, I really don't. And again, it, it, it's, it's, we, we give so much um, a focus and attention to the federal, right? We're talking about Congress and the president and all that. But you think about it. What happens when right. you have, have a mayor or an alderman? In my case, my alderman, uh, at the next election, he will have been in office. What, do you, what kind of power and influence does that guy have, right? So yeah, he's got a lot of institutional knowledge. But think about it. What if you got a mayor that's been in office for 30 years? Right, you got a, uh, a a school board president that's been been in office for twenty years. The the power and the influence that they have to affect not only their election but other elections, and that's how their 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 power evolves because others tag onto them and, they, and they're picking their 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 support their support staff. Right, so the mayor that's been in office for thirty years picks his or her. Uh, councilmen that are gonna, you know, kind of go along with him. So I'm gonna help this guy get elected. He's my buddy. He's my friend. And then we're gonna be on the. He's gonna be on the council. I'm gonna be mayor. He's gonna give me what I want. I mean, you know, we're gonna wash each other's hands. And that's what happens again at the federal level, up the line, right? So now you got, you got 435 congressmen. Uh, let's say 350 of those guys or gals have been in office for 12, 15, 18 years, 26 years, like that. They're a lot, right? And so they're, right. why, what, what's their motivation to be accountable? How are they held accountable? They get elected with huge numbers every year. Most often, nobody even runs against them. You know, so what's the point? We need term limits across the board at every level. It works well for the presidency, right? I think Roosevelt. Yes, uh, yes. 
the last president he had four terms, uh, and he, he died in office in his third term or something. I don't know. But anyway, it works very well at the presidency. It will work just as well at the Senate and the Congress and the City Council and the Park District and the School Board and everywhere else we have. We have it's no more than three terms or no more than 12 years or something. I, mean, I agree. Yeah. Our, our forefathers never designed Congress for people to go there and make it a career for 50 years. It was supposed to be where everybody from the businessman to the dressmaker to the average farmer could come in and have a voice and have a say about how things are run. Uh, the, the people of the country were supposed to have a vested interest in, in their own country by taking a participatory, uh, uh, oh, how do I say this, uh, a, 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 particip a, a participant role in government. Yeah, exactly. And then when you did that, you'd go back home and be a dressmaker, a farmer, a dentist, or whatever, right? You didn't sit there for sure. 50 years. So, yes. Uh, you know, we're fortunate, I think. Um, we we have a candidate for governor here in Illinois who is at least broaching that uh, concept as part of his, uh, I guess it's part of his campaign. I don't know. I haven't been following it. But anyway, he's talking about term limits, and he's actually starting a petition drive to get an initiative on the ballot term limits for uh, all, all uh, state legislators. State senators, state state representatives, and all of the you know statewide uh, county governor, lieutenant governor, treasurer, etc., attorney general, everybody would come under a term limit. If he, if this guy has his way. I don't know if he's making it. I I like it. I really do. I I like it because I think it's going to be the only way to actually get uh, the people of the country back into a position of power who have some vested interest in their own future. I think that uh, having people in Congress who are stuck there for 25, 30 years is why people are so disinterested in Congress. We have a Congress and we have a government that is the most self-serving elected officials ever, and we have a divisive uh, a political climate in this country where no one's talking to each other anymore, and we have a a constituency that has given Congress and the presidency the lowest approval rating ever. Yeah, you know, and and we are almost turning into if we don't get some term limits, I think that we could wind up sometime in my lifetime turning into a third world dictatorship. Well, I, I think you're. I don't know if we'll turn into a third world dictatorship. I mean, I, I think more likely that we'll turn into a one party, uh, where one party, probably the Democratic Party, will take control and and have control forever. Like it is in Illinois. Right. In Illinois, you know, you can't, nobody can say that the Republicans are screwing things up in the state of Illinois because. The Democratic Party controls the state legislature, and every constitutionally elected statewide office in the state. There is no Republican anywhere. Well, wait a minute. I think there's Judy Bartow Pink. I think she's a Republican. But essentially, the Democrats have entire uh, legislative control of the state of Illinois. So you can't blame the Democrats. And, and Illinois is really screwed up. We're at the bottom of the list in job creation. High, highest in unemployment, education system, disaster, high tax rates, high crime rates, everything, all issues in Illinois, and, and, it, it, and it is and it has been controlled by one party for many years. So I think well, look that, at what's happened to Detroit. That's the, Detroit's another great example. Uh, you, you, want, you want to see a great idea of a, of a liberal success? Look at Detroit. You know, I, I don't even think that this is so much a Democratic issue or a Republican issue as much as it is a liberal issue, even though it seems to be that most liberals are Democrats. But um, in 1950, Detroit used to be the brain power capital, not just of the USA, of the planet. There was no better place to be in 1950 than in Detroit. It was a city of 1.8 million people. It was a vibrant manufacturing center. You had more 
professors of mathematics, more metallurgists, more engineers, more scientists, more physicists, more educators in Detroit than you had at any particular point in the world. And then Detroit had its problems. And I think that um, a lot of what happened with Detroit to actually cause the racial strife between uh, uh, blacks and whites in Detroit is that it grew so fast that there were a lot of uh, people who down south were unemployed that became a uh, part of law enforcement and they brought their southern attitude of law enforcement with them. I'm not surprised that Detroit erupted into what it did in 1967. Uh, people who were not allowed to protest or take an interest in local politics peacefully surely will do so violently. But still, that doesn't stop the fact that you had Democrats that took control of Detroit in 1961, and it has been going on for years, and they have literally run it into the ground. And I, I look at some of the pictures and some of the places that I've been in Detroit, you know, how, how far we've come from being a manufacturing powerhouse to a place of economic decay where whole office building downtown multi-story are just allowed to rot. Yeah. And corruption is, is just running rampant. So, you know what? Anyway, hey, let's let's. Uh, I want to shift and talk a little bit about. Uh, so we talk about how the shutdown, the government shutdown, came to be, right? And now I want to talk about the effect of that shit. What what happened? What was the mechanics and some of the the uh, citizens pushback uh, against it? You know, we had the uh, where we had the bikers that went out. Two million bikers went to to D.C. We had the truckers that went. Oh, to I wish I could have joined them. And we went, and now I think there's... Any a, excuse to take my BMW on a cross-country trip. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, I'm a biker, too, and I'll tell you, back uh, for Memorial Day, um, me and two buddies rode over to Washington, D.C. Uh, to participate in the Rolling Thunder, and that was awesome. You know, I mean, there, there were like two or three million, I think, two or three million bikers over there because... And I forget what the actual count was, the estimate from it, from it, but the way they calculated it was that the Pentagon was the rallying point, and the Pentagon has five parking lots, and each parking lot was filled to overflowing, right? So then they sent a helicopter wow. to take a picture of the Pentagon parking lots, and there's a mathematical formula to calculate empty space, blah, blah, blah. So they figured, you know, it's uh, two million bikers there, and... Um, you know, and then you maybe half of those had a passenger, so you know it's probably 2.5 million bikers uh, plus other vehicles. And such. Well, it was really, it was really an awesome experience. It was very powerful, very moving uh, to go there. For. So I would encourage you. There's also that. there's also another trip that they do. Um, it's called the 911 Memorial Run. Uh, the uh, and they start at Shanksville, Pennsylvania, where the aircraft went into the ground. Right, uh, that's right. right there, and then they go from there to the Pentagon, and then they overnight in Washington D.C., and then they go to the World Trade Center in New York City, and it, it, it's a, a police escort all the way, police officers from all over the country. Uh, come and, and escort these bikers as they go on this trip. So you'll see, you know, a cop car from Alaska and another cop car from Arizona and you know, two from Chicago and three from California or something, you know. And it's really cool. And I think they do that one in August every year. So there's another one. Oh, I'm a refrigeration mechanic class four. So during when it's really hot down here, this is our busy season. Uh, you know, uh, refrigeration just breaks down right and left. Once it hits 105 degrees, we have all kinds of problems. Units just cough up and, and, and just roll over with a heart attack. And sometimes I, there are times during the summertime I've put in 16, 18-hour days. Wow. Hey, Max, I see you. What do you ride, Keith? 
Um, I have a uh, 04 Ultra Classic, and then I got a uh, custom custom chopper that I run around locally. I can't take long trips on that one. But the Ultra Classic, <laughs> I'll blast off on the Ultra Classic with the Iowa, Tunica, Mississippi, you know, Minneapolis. So, Harley Davidson? Yeah. Oh, okay. I, um, I, I had a Harley Davidson uh, uh, once. I, I did like it, but it was good for around town. Now, I'm older from the late 70s, but boy, you get it out of the freeway and you have to stop and make sure that your fillings are still intact when you get off of it. Now, I didn't come into this country until I was 18. Uh, so I, I grew up in Europe, and I had two of my favorite uh, motorbikes, um, Vincent, which you never could get over here, and BMW. And BMW boxes were kind of shaky and shuddery at an idle, like a Harley, dribble a little oil, but once you actually wind it up to about 30 miles an hour, it's smooth. It is smooth. Hey, Max. Uh, Dwayne, you can feel free to create a chat room, and Vicky will join you for your discussion on gay rights. Oh, I guess are we just about done? Yeah. So I was going to say, okay. Max, if you want to go ahead and end this discussion, uh, maybe Dwayne and I can continue. Uh, 